did deliver. The newsroom is next. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Turn right onto Pennsylvania 45 West, Old Turnpike Road. Donald Trump is an unserious man. But the consequences of putting Donald Trump back in the White House are extremely serious. This is Andrew Peach in London, also in the newsroom. After a controversial visit to Moscow, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is in Ukraine. We'll meet the Nigerian couple hoping to win table tennis gold on the challenges of preparing for the Paralympics. Continue on Pennsylvania 45 West for three miles. Dreisbach Church Road. Rescuers have been recovering bodies from a bus that plunged into a river in Nepal. About 40 people are thought to have been on board. The bus was on its way to Nepal's capital, Kathmandu, from Pokhara, a tourist hotspot in the Himalayan foothills. Britain's Minister for Development, Annalise Dodds, has said tens of thousands... Take the next left onto Dreisbach Church Road. ...situation after fleeing to South Sudan. She visited a camp in Bentiu, where 100,000 people are facing acute hunger, having been marooned by floodwaters. Continue for five miles. Held incredible elections in South Sudan. I was very clear when I met with government ministers in South Sudan that there has to be free and fair elections. Now there are important preconditions for those elections to be free and fair, which the government has to deliver on. That includes, for example, having a unified armed forces. It includes having the correct institutions in place as well to have a free uh, election. In a landmark 
Court ruling, a transgender woman in Australia has won a discrimination case against a women-only social media app. Roxanne Tickle was barred from People for Girls, which markets itself as an online refuge for women where men are not allowed. To gain access, she had to upload a photo to prove her identity. But seven months after successfully joining the platform, her membership was revoked. Investigations have been launched in South Korea into the managers of a hotel and a fire department after seven people were killed in a blaze. The fire took hold of the upper floors of a nine-story hotel in the city of Bucheon that had been constructed in 2003 before requirements for sprinklers were codified into law. Two of the victims had jumped out of a window and were killed after an air mattress on the ground flipped. Twelve people were injured with some smoke inhalation. The cause of the fire is unknown. That's the latest BBC News. And this is Andrew Peach here on the BBC World Service. Just over a month ago, she was a small part of a campaign to see Joe Biden re-elected for a second term in the White House. Now she's been resoundingly endorsed by her party's national convention taking place in Chicago to take on Donald Trump herself. It has been a roller coaster ride these past few weeks for Kamala Harris. Our correspondent Emma Vardy was at the Democratic National Convention to see her accept the nomination and set out her vision for the nation she's hoping to lead. A month ago, many people did not envisage this moment. America's lesser-known second-in-command propelled into the starring role. Now, Kamala Harris is the woman Democrats believe can make history by becoming the first female president of the United States. On behalf of everyone whose story could only be written,
there's less of the joyful, sunny optimism that we've had from her, which is such a contrast with the way Joe Biden was um, running his election campaign before he stepped aside. And this was more controlled, more serious, and probably deliberately so, in order to introduce herself to the country, not only just who she is and telling us a little bit more of her backstory, but very much trying to present herself as somebody that they can see as their president, as their commander-in-chief, and whom they can trust, really, with the nation. And if that's what she was trying to do, I think it was probably reasonably effective, but it just didn't have the uplifting mood that some of the other speakers at this convention have had and that she's been able to bring to some of her rallies. Did it get us any closer to knowing what she would do if she became president? It set the tone. I think she gave us some broad brush. She says she wants to cut taxes for lower paid people, that she wants to build more homes to make the cost of housing more affordable. There's a big focus on bringing down the cost of prescription drugs and making access to, to medicine cheaper and easier for people. And a big focus as well on moving the country forward. I think there's quite an effective phrase that they're using a lot in this campaign and that you've heard chanted around the hall again and again and again, which is we're not going back. That sounds fairly superficial, but it can mean quite a number of things. It means we're not going back to the guy you've had as president before. And you know all about him, you know what it was like when he was president. Let's not move back to that. But also it's supposed to represent the idea that if Donald Trump was re-elected, he would remove some rights from Americans. And really interesting, Hillary Clinton used to talk a lot when she was running for the presidency about the importance of it being the first woman potentially in the White House. Come on, I didn't mention it. Not one word about the fact that she is only ever the second female candidate for a major political party running for president, that if elected she would be the first woman president. Never mentioned at all in this speech, very, very rarely mentioned actually at all by her in the campaign. She doesn't have to, I mean, think it's pretty obvious that she um, is a female candidate and would be the first woman president, but it's not something that in she makes In 1,000 feet, deal turn about. right onto New Berlin Highway. ...in Chicago at uh, bbc.com slash news online for you. Narendra Modi has become the first Indian Prime Minister to go to Ukraine since the country declared independence 33 years ago. Turn right onto New Berlin Highway. He wants to see a peaceful resolution of the war with Russia. Previously, he's refused to condemn Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine two and a half years ago. Continue on New Berlin Highway for seven miles. ...imports of Russian oil effectively throwing a financial lifeline to Moscow. Mr. Modi's trip to Kiev comes just a few weeks after he was in the Russian capital talking to Vladimir Putin. So what's he trying to achieve now in Kiev? I've been talking to our correspondent there, Nick Beek. Well, I think what Mr. Modi is trying to do, Andrew, is walk a sort of quite difficult, uh, potentially hazardous balance between uh, Russia and Ukraine, and, and certainly any world leader who arrives here in Kiev and stands shoulder to shoulder with President Zelensky is welcomed by the Ukrainians, but fresh in people's minds will be this trip six weeks ago that you mentioned when Narendra Modi went to Russia. He embraced President Putin, quite literally, and this was on the day that Russian missiles had killed more than 40 people across Ukraine. One of the missiles hit a maternity unit here in the capital, Kyiv, and it provoked a very, if not angry, disappointing response from President Zelensky at the time, who said, really, it, it was a huge disappointment, in his words, to see the leader of the world's largest democracy hug the world's most bloody criminal, as he described Mr. Putin. So I think this is an attempt, Andrew, for Mr. Modi to really keep Western partners on side and show that he's willing to talk to Mr. Zelensky today and willing to show support for the Ukrainian people. Although, again, as you say, he hasn't outright condemned the Russian full-scale invasion of two and a half years ago. What sort of support is Narendra Modi offering? I mean, clearly visible support, moral support, any more than that? Not clear whether it extends further than that, to, to be fair. Officially, this is being billed as a, a visit which will strengthen economic ties also in in the realms of defense technology and science could it be the case that this is in some part a possible way forward in terms of a, a peace initiative and ultimately trying to find a truce between ukraine and russia the indian
Americans aren't really giving any suggestion that it could be. In contrast to the Chinese, who we know over the past couple of years have come up with proposals or certainly a framework or thoughts about how there might be a peace deal in the future. So unclear really what Mr Modi is able to offer, apart from this the show of support. But, but as you say, a crucial point is that since the West applied sanctions to Russian crude oil, for example, India has been buying lots of this d discounted Russian product, and I think that will be something that's noted by the Ukrainians, I'm sure, this money that continues to flow to the Kremlin. That was Nick Pink in Kiev. This is Andrew Peach in London. You're listening to the BBC World Service. It's considered a landmark ruling. An Australian court has ruled in favour of someone, born male, now identifying as a woman. Roxanne Tickle filed the lawsuit against a women-only social media app called Giggle for Girls after being banned from the platform. Let's go to our correspondent in Sydney, Katie Watson, for a bit more on this case. Tell us, Katie, just fill the background in for us first, if you will. Sure, so Roxanne Tiggle was born a male but changed her gender and lived as a woman uh, since 2017. She has a female birth certificate. She downloaded the Giggle for Girls app in 2021. Um, that was marketed as a safe space for women, men are not allowed. And she, as part of the, the process for membership, she had to upload a selfie and gender recognition software would screen out men, check it was all okay. Seven months later, her membership was revoked. She argued that she is legally entitled to be a member of Giggle um, as a woman. She was seeking damages of 200,000 Australian dollars. But the Giggle legal team, they argued that sex is a biological concept, um, that Giggle, um, that, sorry, that Tickle was discriminated on the basis of sex, not gender identity. So she was allowed to be discriminated against because they say that she is a man. Um, but the judge ruled in uh, Roxanne Tickle's favour. And do we know why the, 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 his legal opinion was that uh, Roxanne Tickle was right? So he said that the case, case law consistently finds sex is changeable and not necessarily binary. So dismissing Giggle's argument. Now, uh, Roxanne Tickle has reacted saying that shows that all women are protected from discrimination. She hoped the case would be healing for trans and gender diverse people. But the uh, Giggle um, team have, have said, you know, in fact, it was Sal Grover, the CEO of the, of the app, um, has said that the fight continues uh, for women's rights. Uh, in terms of the implications of this in Australia, there might be early days to know, but has anyone been able to work them through as to what this means for other areas of life? Also, the, those who support Sal Grover, the CEO of Giggle, have said that this is a concern for women only spaces in Australia. And in fact, um, it, you can connect it to a, a, an international treaty that the UN adopted in 1979, the Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Now, Giggle argued that Australia ratified that. So, in fact, women's rights, including single sex spaces, they needed to be um, protected. So, I think, you know, what the implication is for um, women only spaces in Australia, but more so, what this means for sex-based versus gender identity rights in court cases, those who signed up to that, uh, ratified that treaty, you know, we might see legal precedents, what other countries might do, you know, in, in a similar way to Australia now that we've seen this court case. Katie, thank you. Katie Watson, live from Sydney. Seven people have died after a fire broke out in a hotel in South Korea. It took hold in the early evening in a nine-storey building. Our sole correspondent, Jean McKenzie, has the details for us. Some of the guests were found dead on the stairs and in the hallway of the hotel, according to a local official. Two others died jumping out of the window onto an inflatable mattress on the ground below. The first person caught the corner of the mattress as they landed, causing it to flip as the second jumped. More guests are being treated in hospital with serious injuries, some caused by inhaling the smoke. Firefighters believe the most likely cause of the fire was an electrical fault. Police are investigating whether the hotel's managers were in any way negligent. The hotel did not have sprinklers installed as it was built in 2003 before this became a legal requirement. A new round of talks to secure a ceasefire deal in Gaza is expected in Cairo as the US ambassador to the UN told the Security Council an agreement is in sight. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israeli troops will remain on Gaza's border with Egypt come what may. Here's our Middle East correspondent, Yolan Now. We understand that US negotiators and Egyptian negotiators have been meeting already in Cairo. Of course, 
both their countries are key mediators between Hamas and Israel in these indirect talks. And now we understand that the Americans have also been meeting with the Israeli negotiating team that has honored the, the heads of the, the two main Israeli intelligence agencies. And the sticking point's really about, you know, Israel's determination to keep a military presence in Gaza beyond the war. It said that it wants to keep troops in the Netzarim corridor, which is this uh, corridor it's set up dividing Gaza into a northern and, and southern part, and also along the Philadelphia corridor, as Israel calls it, that is this buffer zone between Gaza and Egypt that includes also the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. Now, Egypt is not just a mediator there, it's also an interested party, of course. The control of this area it is something that has been covered by bilateral agreements in the past between Egypt and Israel. And Egypt, like Hamas, does not want to have a, a continuing Israeli military presence there. And Israel has been saying it, it needs that presence because it needs to stop Hamas from rearming, from smuggling weapons across that border. Egypt has really been insisting that it has taken action to, to shut off smuggling routes. In a quarter mile, turn left onto Pennsylvania 104 South, North Main Street. Painting 22 different sporting disciplines. Our reporter Emmanuel Akin Dubua has been talking to one husband and wife team who are hoping to win gold for Nigeria in the table tennis. Take the next left onto Pennsylvania 104 South, North Main Street. Yeah, my husband practices every day, five times in a week. Sometimes in the evening, sometimes morning and evening. I will try my possible best to make her a champion. And I will teach her all the little experience that I, I have in the game. Christiana and Coyote will compete in different in 1,000 feet, turn right onto US 522 South, West Market Street. Different disabilities. Christiana uses a wheelchair, while her husband, Coyote, has lost the use of his right leg and needs supports to walk. They face life's practical challenges together. At the light, turn right onto US 522 South, West Market Street. In this country, if you are a physical challenge in this country, you do many things by yourself. Like, just for example, if I'm coming to, maybe I'm going to school or I'm coming to training, it's difficult for me to meet up with the transport. According to the statistics contained in the Nigeria National Development Plan, less than 1% of people with disabilities in the country are employed, and less than 2% have access to education. Table tennis allowed Christiana and Coyote to find something meaningful in their lives. And of course, continue on US 522 South for 20 yes. miles. This is because we train together. <laughs> we listen to each other. We listen to each other. Yes. Paris 2024 will be the couple's first Paralympic Games. Coyote will compete in the Class 6 men's singles with Christiana in the women's Class 5. They are hoping it will be a time in their lives to remember together. I find joy. This sport. This time I'm playing. I don't have anything to worry about. Once I'm playing table tennis, I feel healthy and I improve my disability. And table tennis is my life. My target is to collect gold for the country and make the Africa proud as well. Many more stories from the Paralympics to come. This weekend, there are hundreds of music festivals around the UK. But big outdoor events can be bad news for the environment, which is why one festival in Bristol, headlined by the 90s band Massive Attack, is doing things a bit differently. David Serto has been to find out more.
she views the world, how she faces adversity. Her mother was somebody who really instilled this sort of confidence in her that she's always carried with her, especially when she's been counted out, which of course was a bit of a theme this week, right? We heard her say she's often been underestimated, but she's never doubted herself. So that, I think, was a really interesting point to see her make, particularly because she is somebody who would much rather talk about her record than her own biography. I think her bringing so many family members on stage just helped to really sell this narrative and give you the behind-the-scenes look at her as someone who can connect to people who have to work at McDonald's like she says she had to do and who may be having difficulties with just keeping some of the basic necessities. She let them know that she knows where they're coming from and had people on stage who can back up that story. We heard that a lot, didn't we? This reference to, I know about the middle class because I am middle class. I will work for the middle class because I am middle class. And contrasting her background with that of Donald Trump, Courtney. Yeah, I think at one point she really tried to underscore building up the middle class. She called it the defining goal of her presidency if she was to win in November. We haven't heard a ton from her on you know detailing her policy, but she's really underlined that idea of tax breaks for the middle class, building up the middle class, which echoes a lot of what Joe Biden did as well during his presidency, which of course she's part of his administration. It was a point that she really wanted to drive home in terms of contrasting herself to Donald Trump as somebody who is looking out for the wealthy, according to her. She did talk in a way headlines of what her policies might be, perhaps not lots of detail, but what she was hoping to achieve, what she was hoping to get done. What stood out for you there, Brandon? Yeah, I know talking to people here today earlier, one of the more common things people were looking to hear was how she was going to bring together the country and to help heal divisions. People were saying that they're tired of the toxicity that they see in politics. And I think she touched on that in a lot of her messaging when she talked about an injustice against one of us is an injustice against all of us. You know, I'm gonna create economic opportunities for everyone. So I think her campaign did a good job of keeping their ear to the ground to know that people are looking, you know, to bring everyone together. And she used we and United and you know, I accept this nomination on behalf of the people. She really drive home that point of, unlike the chaos that Democrats say Trump brings and the division that they say Trump brings, she's here to do the opposite. And the Democrats really have rallied together over the last few days. I mean, you'd expect that in many ways. It is their convention. They're trying to put forward that vision of unity, excitement, and energy, which was not the case just over a month ago when there was a completely different candidate. Let's have a look at some of the highlights of the convention and, and how this was addressed. Courtney, everyone that Democrats would want to see came out this week. Oprah Winfrey, Bill Clinton, Stevie Wonder. Were those the highlights for the crowd? Certainly for you know, older members of the party, having figures like Bill Clinton, who's considered the great communicator. Kamala Harris is the only candidate in this race who has the vision, the experience, the temperament, the will, and yes, the sheer joy to get something done. Having Oprah Winfrey, who is a cultural touchstone for a lot of people. When a house is on fire, we don't ask about the homeowner's race or religion. We don't wonder who their partner is or how they voted. No, no. We just try to do the best we can to save them. It was also sort of shied away from the political spotlight in recent years. She did endorse Barack Obama, who she counts as a personal friend in 2008. She hasn't really been in the limelight, political limelight, and she really cast herself as an independent and was trying to appeal to independent voters in her speech. So I think that was a highlight for some of the older members of the party, while we saw some younger members, you know, really enthusiastic, certainly about the Obamas and maybe some of the celebrities that we saw come out on Kamala Harris's behalf this week. Let's talk about the Obamas for a moment, particularly Michelle Obama, Brandon. There was a tremendous reaction to her, wasn't there? Yeah, she definitely had the crowd captivated and received a rock star-like reception. Kamala knows, like we do, that regardless of where you come from, what you look like, who you love, how you worship, or what's in your bank account, we all deserve the opportunity to build a decent life. All of our contributions deserve to be accepted and valued. Because no one has a monopoly on what it means to be an American. No one. Both Michelle and Barack have 
at the crowd, really animated me into what they were saying, repeating the chants, laughing at the punchlines. When it ended, I asked people, you know, which do you feel delivered a stronger performance? And everyone pretty much unanimously said Michelle. So, you know, she lived up to her reputation, which Barack even commented on as he walked on stage saying, I made the mistake of signing up to speak after my wife. We can't forget, of course, about the vice presidential pick, Governor Tim Walz, Courtney. He really gave also a barnstorming speech, didn't he? He did, and I think he really performed in his role as Kamala Harris's attack dog. He gave a forceful speech. He went after Trump. He highlighted his own background as a coach, as a congressman, as a school teacher. And I think for a lot of Americans, that came off as relatable, you know, as somebody you know from the Midwest. We're all here tonight for one beautiful, simple reason. We love this country. Boy, do we have the right team. Kamala Harris is top. Kamala Harris is experienced. And Kamala Harris is ready. And I think in terms of introducing himself on the national stage at a moment when, you know, we've seen him sort of face some stumbles or some previous controversies, it was by all means a success for Tim Walls. There was a lot of talk all week long about unity within the party, but we can't gloss over the fact that there isn't unity in the party. And outside here and in Chicago, we had many protests and demonstrations, some delegates staging a sit-in outside here for quite some time. How do you think they handled that, Courtney, or Kamala Harris in particular? Well, we did hear a bit of her speech tonight addressing the situation in Gaza, reinforcing the U.S. policy on defending Israel. She didn't veer at all from the administration talking points on that, but you know, did say that she supported Palestine's right to dignity and freedom, and she did say that the humanitarian situation needed to be addressed, and she was working with the president on trying to secure a ceasefire. But I don't think that would satisfy some of the protesters outside who were hoping that the Democrats would make room for a Palestinian to speak at the event this week. They had asked for over two months uh, for a speaking slot, and last night some Harris advisors and Democrats came out to speak to the protesters and try and emphasize that today was about Harris as the nominee. But there's a lot of disappointment that their protests were being heard. So we'll have to see how that plays out, especially in states like Michigan, which is a battleground state. So, Brandon, do you think, can we call this convention a success? Are there signs of unease within the Democratic camp? I think by and large it was successful. I've been comparing it to church on Easter Sunday. And, you know, it's like there's no sin and everyone's going to have it. And at the Democratic Convention, it felt like victory in November was inevitable. There was really no division within the party. Everyone here is pretty much drinking the Democratic Kool-Aid. And I think that the speakers they brought out all the way up to Vice President Harris said what people wanted to hear and said it in a way that got them excited about the election. You know, the we're not going back is something that people have really bought into. And no matter who said that, the crowd would just go crazy and repeat after her. So the messaging has stuck. People are excited. And it seems as if they're ready to go out and carry on this momentum from here through the race. So we've looked at the highlights of the Democratic National Convention and the biggest speech of Kamala Harris's career. Next, I want to talk about whether the Democrats' current momentum will actually translate to votes at the ballot box in November and what hurdles could lie ahead. In a quarter mile, slight left onto Back Maitland Road, This is The Global Story from the BBC World Service. There's a fresh episode available as a podcast each weekday. Please do like and subscribe so you don't miss out. And before we get back to today's conversation, I just want to let you know about a couple of those episodes that we're working on. Make a slight left onto Back Maitland Road. Huge amounts of money spent by candidates in the US presidential campaign. And we'll also have all the analysis after the first... Continue for 11 miles. Trump and Kamala Harris in September. So if you have a question you want to answer on those or any topic, you can get 
get in touch by email at theglobalstory at bbc.com or send us a message on WhatsApp. Our number is plus four four three three zero one two three nine four eight zero. I'm in Chicago speaking to Courtney Supermanian and Brandon Drennan from the BBC's digital team. But Kamala Harris's opponent, Donald Trump, came up quite a few times this week, as might be expected, in various speeches and also in the speech tonight, of course, from the Vice President Kamala Harris herself. Brandon, what did you make of those mentions of Donald Trump? You know, one of the things Democrats have been concerned about in November is whether or not voters had Trump amnesia and if they were going to have the same enthusiasm to come out and vote to keep him out of office. And I think she was intentional and did a pretty strong job of reminding them of the things about Trump that they didn't like in 2020 when they came out to vote for Biden. In many ways, Donald Trump is an unserious man. But the consequences of putting Donald Trump back in the White House are extremely serious. When she was attacking Trump was when I saw many of the strongest reactions from the crowd. And, you know, abortion is one of her strong points, and she did a very good job, as she's done multiple times up to today, of reminding people of what Trump has said about having the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade and how she's going to fight to get abortion rights federally protected. Well, we trust women. Personally, has been a part of his playbook for a long time. He's been very 
successful up to this point. And I think he operates off the MO, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Now this convention obviously was in one way a big test for Kamala Harris and the campaign. They had to turn everything on its head with just a couple of weeks notice given the change at the top of the ticket. But they're playing to it an easy crowd here. Almost everyone in that arena was in love with almost everyone that spoke from the stage at, at one point or another. But Courtney, how does that messaging move beyond this convention center to the rest of America and to voters who maybe aren't committed Democrats? As you mentioned, this was very much an easy audience for Kamala Harris. She, you know, it was high stakes in that she had to get up there and introduce herself and lay out her vision. But you know, I think the rest of the election, it, that's where the big tests are going to come, especially because she didn't have to endure a primary election where you go through, you know, a lot of scrutiny about your policy agenda, where you go through debates um, and you, you know, have to perform. There is no policy agenda on her website that, you know, typically candidates usually put out there. Um, and for her aides, you know, I've talked to them about this. They are riding that wave of enthusiasm all the way to the beach. They don't see a need to really try and disrupt that. But I think that debate on September 10th is going to be the big test. Can she really stand up to Donald Trump and be effective and be the prosecutor that she's painted herself as, that she you know, has highlighted in her career record, and make the case that she belongs in the Oval Office? A big part of that, of course, is we haven't heard from her in an interview. We haven't heard her take questions from reporters. Is that something that she needs to do? That's what people here today told me they're waiting for. One person I spoke to specifically said, I want to know how she's going to be different than Joe Biden. We don't want a Biden 2.0. So they're waiting for her to sit down and to get into the specifics of how she's going to do these grandiose claims, like improve the lives of the middle class and unify the country. People want to know exactly how, and I think they're waiting for her to get into that. It's smart and strategic on her behalf to not mess up a good thing. And as long as polls keep showing her in the lead and she's filling out stadiums and it seems like the money and the energy is going to remain behind her, then I think her and the campaign are going to be very careful about, you know, releasing new information that could harm them. I think one of her biggest vulnerabilities is her interview style. You know, she's gotten a lot of criticism for word salads and as somebody who's interviewed her, she gets a bit tangled up in policy and trying to, you know, give context around answers. I think her aides are certainly worried about landing that first big interview, especially when she gave an interview at the beginning of her vice presidency that really defined the first few years when she fumbled. And so I think they're a bit nervous about really making sure that first interview goes well, but also making sure that she articulates, as Brandon say, her policy and distinguishing where she stands now and how that differs from a lot of the progressive policies that she was pushing in 2019 when she ran for president and ultimately failed and was named to Joe Biden's ticket. We as journalists want her to do an interview, and we would like to do that interview ourselves. Come Harris, if you're listening, BBC News, we're available. But how much do ordinary voters actually care about whether she does an interview or not? I don't think they care as much about how many interviews she's doing, you know, whether she's doing interviews. I think they just want to hear more about how she's going to govern. And they've heard a lot in media about some of her previous policies. She really tacked to the left when she was running her own presidential candidacy in 2019. She became a more moderate governing partner to Joe Biden running on his policy. So, you know, I think the question is, what is her presidency going to look like? And a lot of people want to know, you know, where she's going to stand on some of these issues that matter to them. So does it feel like this campaign has only just begun? I think for a lot of Americans, this campaign has only just begun. This is a point which a lot of people are sitting up and paying attention, asking questions about who Kamala Harris is, even though she's been around for the last four years on the national stage. But I would also say that 
what's there 74 days until the election a lot can happen in 74 days and there's a lot of big moments where she has to sort of prove her mettle to show americans that she is able and willing to serve but there's confidence coming out of here brandon isn't there the folks we've seen all night long one woman was yelling on the steps in the stadium uh, as I was walking out, we won, we won, I'm already calling it. Uh, so people are on a high. As we've discussed, you know, for the last four days, we've seen some of the biggest names in the Democratic Party speak. We've seen several celebrities. We've heard rousing music. Everyone here is more or less thinking on a similar wave pattern. So people feel very confident and and are thinking that, you know, as this woman said, November's in the bag. But as politicians were particular about reminding voters and delegates when they were on the stage over the past four days, this isn't a, a, a gimme, right? We still have to work for this. Well, Senator said to me, this is a sprint. We can't drop the pace now. Not many days to go, but plenty can still happen between now and the 5th of November. And we will cover all of that here on The Global Story, of course. Thanks so much to you both for joining me today. I know it's been a very long day and week for everyone. Thanks so much, Courtney. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. And as always, thanks so much to you for listening. We're back at the same time each weekday on the BBC World Service. And you can also listen as a podcast. Just search for The Global Story wherever you get your BBC pods. Wherever you're listening in the world. Bye-bye. This is the BBC World Service, with Harriet Gilbert to tell you about World Book Club. The German writer Ewald Ahrens answers questions about his best-selling novel, Tasting Sunlight. It's the moving story of an unlikely friendship between a reclusive woman managing a family farm and the teenage runaway who takes refuge there. World Book Club, from the 7th of September. Ukraine's president after sparking anger by hugging Vladimir Putin. Kamala Harris accepts the Democrats' nomination for the U.S. presidency in Chicago. And a transgender woman from Australia wins a discrimination case after being denied access to a social media app. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Next on the BBC World Service, the Outlook Mixtape. With me, Aussie Books. The policewoman who can't escape her work. I know you. I know your face. And he's kind of really looking at me, really embarrassed as well. Because you think, did I arrest you? How do I know you? I know you from somewhere. Did I stop you? Ah, oh my God. That's where I know you from. From the girl. Yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking, oh, it's you. And he's probably thinking, it's you. <laughs> Mum, let's go. She's not a good character. And we'll meet other remarkable women, grinning at football, standing out for indigenous rights, plus a global drag superstar. I was always proud that I did it. I was proud that it came out the way it did, because there was also this bitter defiance in me, specifically towards the girls I competed against, to be like, clearly I was right because I won. <laughs> <laughs> That's all after the latest news. Hello, I'm Chris Barrow with the BBC News. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi have embraced each other on Mr Modi's arrival in Kiev, the first visit by an Indian leader to independent Ukraine. Weeks ago, Mr Zelensky said it had been a devastating blow to see Mr Modi warmly welcomed by Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Here's Nick Beek. Officially, this is being billed as a, a visit which will strengthen economic ties also in, in the realms of defence, technology and science. So unclear really what Mr Modi is able to offer, apart from this... In a quarter mile, turn right onto Kishakatiya Street. Is that since the West applied sanctions to Russian crude oil, for example, India has been buying lots of this d discounted Russian product, and I think that will be something that's noted by the Ukrainians for sure. This money that continues to flow to the Kremlin.
Kamala Harris has promised to reject Take the next right onto Kishakakia Street, then turn left onto East Charles Street. He accepted the Democratic nomination for president. Ms. Harris told cheering supporters at the party's convention in Chicago that the U.S. had a fleeting chance to move past bitterness and cynicism. Our North America editor, Sarah Smith, has this analysis. She says she wants to cut taxes for At the light, people. turn left onto East Charles Street. To make the cost of housing more affordable. There's a big focus on bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. And a big focus as well on moving the country forward. I think there's quite an effective phrase that they're using a lot in this campaign and that you heard chanted around the hall again and again and again, which is we're not going back. It can mean quite a number of things. It means we're not going back to the guy you've had as president before. But also it's supposed to represent the idea that if Donald Trump was re-elected, he In a quarter mile, merge onto US 22, Doctors Business West. ...testing a new vaccine for lung cancer on patients in seven countries, including Britain, the United States, Germany, and Turkey. Experts have held its groundbreaking potential to save thousands of lives. Elsa Orkney reports. The vaccine instructs the immune system to recognize, hunt down, and kill lung cancer cells. It's designed to work in a similar way to many COVID jabs. It's hoped the treatment will boost a patient's immune response while leaving healthy cells untouched, unlike chemotherapy. Lung cancer is the world's leading cause of cancer deaths, killing 2 million people a year. Survival rates of those with advanced forms of the disease are particularly poor. Scientists hope the vaccine might eventually become the standard of care worldwide. The authorities in Bangladesh are desperately trying to evacuate areas inundated. In, in 1,000 feet, turn left onto Pennsylvania 103 South. Say four and a half million people have now been affected. There have been at least 13 deaths. Homes have been left underwater with residents stranded on rooftops. BBC News. The UN has expressed At the light, turn left onto Pennsylvania 103 South. Libya, Tripoli. The deputy head of the UN mission to Libya said the military and political situation had rapidly deteriorated over the past In a quarter months. mile, turn the right onto Helen Street. has been triggered by attempts by various factions to remove the head of the central bank. Rival armed groups have been mobilizing on each side with a growing threat of force to try to resolve the situation. In a landmark ruling, a transgender woman in Australia has won a discrimination case against a women-only social media app. Roxanne Tickle was barred from Giggle for Girls, which markets itself as an online refuge for women where men are not allowed. From Sydney, Katie Watson has more details. Roxanne Tickle was born a male, changed her gender and has been living as a woman since 2017. Now in 2021, she signed up to Giggle for Girls. Part of the membership process, she had to upload a selfie and gender identification software would check that she was a woman. Now, seven months after she had that membership, her membership was then revoked. She argued that she was legally entitled to join the app as a woman, but Giggle's legal team said that the sex is a biological concept and that Tickle was discriminated. Take the second the right onto Helen Street. Not gender identity. Japan's public broadcaster NHK has apologized after it aired unscripted radio comments claiming disputed islands were Chinese. In 800 feet, you will arrive at your destination. Abuses. The comments were made by a contractor on a Chinese language news show. Speaking to Japan's government's party, the broadcaster's president said the man had been fired. He said NHK would now pre-record news in foreign languages. You have arrived. The German footballer Ilkay Gundogan has re-signed for the English Premier League champions Manchester City. He only left the club 12 months ago to join Barcelona. That's the latest BBC News. Hello. Welcome to the Outlook Mixtape. From me, Ossie Fuchs, and my colleagues... Hello, you're listening to Outlook from the BBC World Service. I'm Mabin Azar. This is the home.